<laughs> All right, we're good. Uh, hi, and welcome to Red Reviews, uh, the podcast where Justin and I talk about whatever book he has scheduled for the week. I got to come up with an actual intro for this show. There are other podcasts <laughs> that do like, welcome to this show where we talk about whatever, but it's like, you know, um, you know, welcome to Red Reviews, the podcast where we talk about is revolution permanent? Question mark? <laughs> well, we have the answer today. <laughs> <laughs> we do, or at least we will attempt to. Yeah. Um, how you doing, Corey? I'm good. How you doing? I'm fine, man. I'm fine. Right it's uh, Monday, and here we're with us recording today. You moved this around so generously so that my wife and I could spend some time tomorrow um, at a uh, Valentine's Day. So I appreciate. Well, that. Uh, uh, I it wasn't entirely altruistic. I also have a partner who I can spend <laughs> Valentine's Day with because of this. <laughs> so, so it's all fantastic. Good. Yeah. That might happen from time to time with the schedule. Like it might like fall on a holiday, and then we just kind of have to figure that out. Yeah. Um, but yeah. So tonight, um, you know, uh, you know, due to popular demand, people have yes. been asking for this for months and months and months and months but tonight we're finally talking about trotsky um we're talking about trotskyism and the book that we'll be covering is called the permanent revolution and results and prospects so this is an edition of it's actually two books in one um okay. published by well-read books out of the uk they are the publishing arm of the international marxist tendency the imt which is a trotskyist organization um, out of the UK. Um, and usually like left-wing publishers that are a little more fringe, like, like there's kind of like a hierarchy, sadly enough, there's kind of a hierarchy of left publishers in terms of like yeah. quality or legitimacy. So like for me, like Verso is like the tops, like it's kind yeah. of like the penguin books of, of the left space. And then like, and then it's like Haymarket books and then it's like PM and AK and then it's kind of everybody else. Um, <laughs> yeah. So where does well-read books fall into that? Well-read is part of the everybody else, but their books are actually very, very nice. Like usually when you get these kinds of books, the print looks like crap, but the print is actually really nice in these books. Oh, nice. Um, they do a really good job of like making books that look like professional and good, which is very, very rare for like old school, you know, leftist theory that's in the public domain. Right. Um, so this is going to be a big episode. I'm going to try to cover a lot in a short amount of time, an hour or an half or so. Um, so who was Leon Trotsky? Leon Trotsky was one of the key revolutionaries of the Bolshevik Revolution. Um, he was also one of the lead military leaders of the Russian Civil War with the Red Army. Um, and, and part of the early Soviet government, he was one of the architects of the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk, which pulled pulled Russia out of World War I um, and helped with Lenin and others build the early Soviet government. Um, but as many know, that there was a sort of internal power struggle between him and Stalin. Mm -hmm. um, and he and Stalin had two very different ideas about how the Soviet Union's future should be. Yeah. And in these two books, um, The Permanent Revolution was published in 1931. And so this is the peak of the beginnings of what would become the sort of the Stalinist takeover of the Soviet Union yeah. and his eventual exile from the Soviet Union um, for supposed crimes. Um, <laughs> and and then eventually, of course, as a lot of people know, mostly from the memes, he was murdered by a Stalinist agent with a, with a nice pick in 1940. Right. Um, he was he he lived a lot of his life in exile in Mexico. He's buried in Mexico. Um, but Trotskyism has always been a key component of the Marxist left. Yeah. Um, you know, I think in general, for most of the 20th century, the Marxist left really, in terms of the revolutionary Marxist left really broke down into two camps. There was the, the Trotskyist camp and essentially the Stalinist camp. Mm -hmm. um, and Stalin- Who, who call yeah. themselves, like, that's, they call themselves Marxist-Leninists. Marxist-Leninists. Nobody yeah. calls someone, themselves a Stalinist. Stalinist. Right? Anybody right. who calls themselves a Stalinist is either, like, 
shit posting or is just sort of politically uh, a neophyte, yeah. a neophyte. But but in general, yeah, it was down to the Leninists and the Trotskyists, and and Trotsky was whether or not he was the true heir of Lenin, or whether or not his interpretation of Marxism was the closest to what Lenin is. I'll leave that discussion for another day. I think in general, I think there's, I think there's arguments on both sides as to whether or not, you know, you know, there are many historians who've argued that a lot of the roots of Stalinism were there from the very beginning Mm -hmm. um, in terms of the Leninist project, whether it was the, you know, ending of the constituent assembly or the institution of war communism or the new economic plan or whatever. Right. Um, the, The development of what would become the NKVD which of course becomes the KGB, um, all of those elements that would become key elements of the sort of Stalinist terror were all kind of there in the beginning. Um, that's what some argue. And then other people argue the other story, which is that sort of Lenin, you know, guided, aided by Trotsky, were like these great revolutionaries who um, – you know, brought forth a new world and it would have been so much better had it gone differently and had Stalin not come to power. I think the truth is somewhere a little bit in the middle. Right, um, right. And I think it's, I think for us as the left is it's like, I think a good question for many people to ask is it's 2023. Why should we care about debates that were going on hundred <laughs> years ago in the Soviet Union or in Eastern Europe? Do, do those debates apply to today? Yeah. Do some of these things Word yeah. for us. And I think and I think they I think they are important. Some um, some certainly do, right? Yeah, I think certain some certainly do. I think there's a lot of elements of Trotskyism that I think are quite admirable. Um one of which is its its commitment to internationalism, um, which is something we'll get more into when we discuss the sort of working the sort of working components of what permanent revolution means. Um and its commitment to a sort of global socialist vision that it's not parochial in the sense that it sort of cares about one country or it cares mm-hmm. about a couple of countries. It kind of cares about the world, a, a global socialist transformation and believes that socialism will really only succeed if it's global, that, right. it, that, it, that it goes from nation to nation to nation. That's something I think I can agree with. Generally. Yes, which is something <laughs> I think I can very much agree with too. And I think if you if, if you're not a you know even if you're not a Trotskyist, I think that's something that's uh, you can agree with. The other thing that I think is important about the idea of permanent revolution is the idea that securing democratic freedoms and democratic rights, which you, which under sort of you know traditional sort of orthodox Marxism, it's like a country goes through a certain level of development, goes from feudalism, and then sort of has its bourgeois democratic revolution, and then from the bourgeois democratic revolution comes the socialist revolution. Mm-hmm. Well, Trotsky kind of argues that like, well, in reality, some countries don't make it to that sort of democratic bourgeois revolution component, um, or if they do, it sort of falls apart. And so one of the ways in which you can sort of institute that sort of bourgeois democratic revolution is through a socialist project that you that basically you sort of jump over a stage and get to the sort of socialist transformation of society. And through doing that, you actually secure all the things that would have been given to people under a sort of bourgeois democratic rule. Um, that I think is interesting too, because I, I think mm. that there are going to be many instances in which, um, the possibility for a socialist revolution will actually be more advantageous than the possibility of a bourgeois democratic one right. in the sense that most of us in sort of the developed world, for lack of a better word, we already sort of live in bourgeois democracies, right? Like in the United States is a bourgeois democracy. Canada is a bourgeois democracy. Yeah. The UK, most of the world is made up of bourgeois democracies. Part of where I think, this book shows its age is the sense in which um, this is pre World War II. This is pre uh, the, the the sort of post World War II um, anti colonial movements across Africa and Latin America, where these nations sort of sloughed off their colonial baggage and became and then had their own independent national struggles. Right. Um, but what you can see from most of those is that again. They don't really go in the route of like a socialist revolution per se, but it's much more of a sort of democratic um, national liberation movement. Right. Which may have socialist elements, but it's not necessarily a socialist movement proper, if that makes any sense. Yeah. And so so I think where um, 
where Trotsky is relevant is thinking about the ways in which global systems are integrated. And that part of the reason why the Soviet Union ultimately fell apart and as a political project is I think from the very real problems that were there from the beginning that were never resolved. And and I think this is where I think Trotsky's prescription is better than what, you know, the sort of the Stalinists or the, the, the Leninists, whatever you call them, um, mm. have. I think that they have this um, you know, and I think one of the things people think of when they think about Trotsky is it's like I've heard Trotskyism being referred to as like the right wing of Marxism. And then like mm. Maoism is like the left wing. And then the Leninists are somewhere in the middle of like, if we had our, if the Marxist left had its own Overton window, that's how I've heard, I've heard it described. Interesting. I actually, I actually think it's kind of the other way around. I think that yeah. like Trotsky's actually, like Trotskyism actually kind of is the left wing of Marxist, revolutionary yeah, Marxist. If I, had to, if I had to put it on a scale, I would definitely not put Stalinism on the left of <laughs> him, Marxism, right? Yeah, because it's fundamentally like counter revolutionary. It yeah. undoes a lot of it. Undoes a lot of it. So, um, so, um, so Trotsky starts developing his idea of permanent revolution in 1904. Okay, and essentially, what he argues for is that the working class would come to power in Russia before Western Europe, which is correct. Yeah. Um, I think that, you know, the Bolshevik revolution for all of its faults truly is the most successful working class revolution in human history, you know, outside of maybe the, the 1949 Chinese revolution, at least in the Marxist sense, I can't speak for anarchism, but at least right. in the Marxist sense. Um, and, and what I think he gets a point at is this idea of like bourgeois revolution being sort of impossible under the czarist rule that like, that like you can't have these sort of bourgeois democratic reforms in Russia, because if you do, then it will sort of open up the floodgates for a lot of, you know, elements of reaction to kind of come back and sort of reassert themselves and essentially create a new form of an autocratic regime, which is also correct. If you look at the end of the Soviet Union to now, if you look at the last 30 years, that's exactly the case. If you look, you know, for, you know, Russia, for all intents and purposes, had sort of this sort of bourgeois democratic revolution in 1991 and, and the Soviet Union ended. Yeah. And the whole goal was to have open, free and open elections and the development of, you know, private economic affairs and all that. But what eventually happened was this sort of worst of all possible worlds where they sort of kept all of the shittiest elements of the Soviet Union, the sort of the, the heavy bureaucracy, the autocracy, the authoritarianism, yeah. and did away with all of the good stuff of the Soviet Union, like universal health care and, you know, <laughs> you know, yeah. housing requirements and, and, um, you know, and, and, you know, certain basics, basic, you know, political and social rights, well, like rights with job and things like that. They were kind of taking some notes from the United States, which I mean, yeah. does everything wrong. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so it stands to reason that they did it. They changed things wrong. Right. And so <laughs> like, you can see how now with the, the rush of, of Vladimir Putin, that it really is this sort of autocratic regime that is yeah. not, it, it sort of it is no longer is it bourgeois yes is it democratic no like it's oh, not yeah. you know it's and you know is it as bad as the, the the feudal system under the czar probably not but it's not that much better still not great yeah yeah and you know so i think that to sort of get into talking about what is the permanent revolution what does that main concept mean and so it basically is in it's in, in contradistinction to Stalin's conception of socialism in one country. Okay. So people have probably heard this sort of these two concepts: you have permanent revolution on one side and socialism in one country on the other. Hmm. What the permanent revolution is is it's essentially made up of two components. It's sort of it's sort of two things going on at once. One of them is the sort of um, the sort of beginning with the sort of the bourgeois tasks, which is sort of freedom of speech, freedom of assembly, like sort of political rights that people would not have under this, did not have under the czar's regime, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it's so then it just sort of directly goes from a revolution directly into a socialist society that you build, 
the dictatorship of the proletariat, or as I like just really to call it, working class a working class government. Because right. dictatorship of the proletariat has its own fucking baggage. Right. And but really what, what that phrase means is a government of the working class. Yeah, that's what it's supposed to mean. That's right? what it's supposed to mean. And then it literally became a dictatorship later <laughs> on. But like but like it's um so you go you basically ensure all of those democratic reforms that would have happened in a bourgeois revolution through a socialist one. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And you sort of jump through a stage to get to the other component. And then the second component of that is um, moving from the nation to the international community. So permanent revolution is very much predicated on the re- revolution, the socialist revolution in Russia, its socialist project will not succeed unless other countries have their own revolutions and become socialist governments too. Hmm. And so early on, there were other countries they were like really hoping would go socialist, like Germany and Poland. And this did not happen. Right. So Germany did not go socialist. Um, and in fact, many, many members of its socialist movement were killed, yeah. um, like Rosa Luxemburg. And in Poland, um, it also did not happen largely as a result of a nationalist movement that was militarily successful, um, in the rush during the era of the Russian Civil War. So by 1921, the idea of Poland becoming a part of the sort of socialist sphere, sphere of influence that had been created by, um, the Russian Soviet Republic didn't happen. Um, and. Right. And then, and so it would take another, you know, 40 years for Poland to really become a part of the Soviet Union. And when it did become a part of the Soviet Union, um, post World War II, it was done by tanks. Yeah. <laughs> so it wasn't, you know, <laughs> yeah. um, and so, uh, which doesn't imply that it was done because they were, they, decided socialism was the right move. <laughs> right. No, it was purely Poland became a component of what Stalin wanted after World War II. So um, just as a quick aside, and then we'll come back, but I do think it's relevant. So in 1945, there's something, they have something called the Yalta Conference. And the three major leaders of the, of the allies in World War II, Churchill, Roosevelt, Prime, British Prime Minister Winston Churchill, American president, United States President Franklin Roosevelt and the Soviet premier or Soviet leaders, Joseph Stalin, met and basically decided the terms of the war because they were going to win. This is like January, February of 45. They knew they were going to win. They knew that – and if they knew they were going to win, they sort of wanted to carve out what they wanted the future to be. And so one of the things that Stalin really wanted was I want basically buffer nations around me. To keep right. me away from Germany because Germany had essentially caused it had been, or had been the instigator of two world wars in a matter of 20 years. Right. So I don't want them as a direct neighbor anymore. <laughs> I don't want them as a direct neighbor anymore. And I don't want nations that are friendly with Germany to be a direct neighbor anymore. Yeah. And so they started to sort of carve up what would be the post-World War II global system. And part of that was Poland being a component of that. Yeah. Um, and – so Poland basically kind of fell to the Soviets and they and it sort of – Roosevelt was more comfortable with it. Roosevelt had a much more conciliatory relationship with Stalin than Harry Truman did. Mm. Um, and part of that was just because of Roosevelt's own deep political experience. He was a much more experienced political leader than Truman was. Um, you know, Truman was quite frankly an idiot compared to FDR. So right. it's – you know. But anyway, so – with so that's kind of how that happened. So Poland would eventually become a part of the Soviet Union, but just not in the ways that sort of Trotsky had wanted. Right. Um, it sort of happened through brute force. It didn't happen. But the thing is, is that like the the the, the war that happens between Poland and Russia in the, during the period of the Russian Civil War, which is nineteen eighteen to nineteen twenty one, that was the Red Army fighting against the Polish nationalist forces. So it was it wasn't like Poland was like having its own revolution and then like. Was and then like the the so like the the early Soviets backed the Polish. It's like no, it was it was still a military conquest. It was right. not you know, um, and so uh, when those when those other nations didn't fall, you know, because there was this sort of theory. Weirdly enough, it's actually kind of like a domino theory. Okay, um, 
which I think when George Kennan, the American diplomat and statesman, came up with the idea of domino theory, he had absolutely read Trotsky and sort of reverted it and sort of flipped it on its head. Um, Because domino theory is basically like, well, if you let one country go communist, then other ones around it will go communist, which is kind of the theory of permanent revolution. It's kind of the idea of, well, if we can get a revolution here, then this revolution will be supported by this other nation if it also has a revolution. And then those two are then supported if another one has a revolution. And so Trotsky had this big vision of like, okay, well, Poland's going to become socialist. And then then like Austria is going to become Poland socialist and then Germany's going to become po- socialist and then the UK is going to go socialist and then God and then you know the, the sort They're of just going to yeah like you say dominoes you know, the, right the, yeah. the, the, the you know the 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 end boss you know was the US and if the US went socialist the game was up yeah and so that's kind of what they were going with Trotsky firmly believed that if Russia was isolated in its in 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 being the only country that had a successful socialist revolution and instituted a socialist government, it would not succeed. And seems, he was right. Yeah, seems like he, <laughs> history bore that. History out. proved him right um, <laughs> in the sense that the uh, Stalin's idea of socialism in one country did not work. Yeah, um, and so Stalin's idea of a socialism in one country was, in effect. Um, you know, was sort of a, it was a sort of counter revolution that essentially argued that uh, there would be sort of two stages to socialist development. Um, It's the theory of two stages where it's like bourgeois democracy then turns into socialist democracy. But, but those two things happen within the umbrella of capitalist development. So like, so it's essentially kind of the way that the Soviet Union eventually worked, where it was like deep mm-hmm. controls, like deep public controls of the government, but it also had ties with capitalist nations and had trade and right. you know, wage labor didn't go away, like the working day didn't go away, like there's all these things that didn't devolve. And um and so what uh what eventually happened is this idea of the two stages of the socialism in one country that you sort of, you bat down the hatches and you make socialism really work in this one country. And then if you can make it work in this one country, then you can convince other countries yeah. that it works. And then maybe they'll happen, have it happen too. But that's not really what happened. And, um, and in fact, the Soviet Union backed multiple different sort of revolutions in other places around the world for example, they tried it in sort of comparable ideas in Iraq and Sudan in the 1950s, mm-hmm. which eventually led to, again, further autocratic regimes, Iraq being the most famous one, which would be the Ba'athist regime right. um, of Saddam Hussein. And then obviously the other one, the one of the worst failures of it was also Indonesia. Okay. Um, and Indonesia, where they sort of led the same path of, you know, sort of, of the, the sort of traditional sort of two-stage socialism one country idea. And that also didn't work. Part of that was also deep involvement by the US and the fact that we propped up a dictator in Indonesia and we helped right. lead a coup against the democratically elected leader of Indonesia. And it led to um, the deaths of 1.5 million people. Um, there's a good, there's a very good book about all of this called the Jakarta Method. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, I've which heard that. which we could probably do on the show at some point to get more in detail about this, um, but essentially it comes down to permanent revolution, moving through bourgeois democracy into a socialist government, and then it being backed up, and that revolution not just ending in one country, but moving to other countries. This is where the permanent of permanent revolution kind of comes in. Okay. You just don't stop at the bourgeois democratic revolution, you go beyond it and go into the socialist revolution and institute a socialist government. Then you don't just do it in one country, you ensure that it happens in other countries, and then those countries unite together against the capitalist powers. Right. Interesting. Um, And so when Trotsky came up with these ideas, they were sort of deeply heretical to the the sort of party bureaucracy even before the the Russian Revolution of 1917 mm. and um, as the early Soviet government was being put into place. So the book, The Permanent Revolution, like all great Marxist tracts, is essentially a response to somebody. 
Course. So we've talked about before how like, you know, like, you know, certain books are responses to other people. So this book, The Permanent Revolution, was a response to a leader within the Soviet government called named Karl Roddick. Okay. And Karl Roddick was critical of Trotsky's idea of revolution. And he was a part of essentially what was the right centrist bloc. The, of the Soviet early Soviet government, which was composed of Stalin and Zinoviev and Bukharin, um, and let's see, and and so, so what this kind of goes into is um, Trotsky sort of refuting the claims that Roddick makes against him. Okay, um, and so let's see, ah. Yeah, so we talked about you know socialism in, in one country, which unfortunately, and you have to understand that the the context of the time, this is 1931. Okay, so when Trotsky calls something national socialism, he doesn't mean Nazism, <laughs> right? Yeah, it's literally like socialism within a nation. It's actually kind of what he means. Like right. when you hear the phrase national socialism, we think of fascism, we think of Nazism. Obviously. Yeah. But but what he's referring to is his critique of socialism in one country. Trotsky essentially argues that socialism within one nation is a dead end, which he was right. right. Yeah. He was right in terms of the Social Democrats in Germany in 1914 when they decided to support World War I and Germany's involvement in World War I and vote for the war credits. And then obviously a few years later when their revolution failed, and then obviously for Stalin and, and the USSR, Stalin came up with the idea of socialism in one country in 1924. Um, and, uh, and so what, what Trotsky argues is that this idea of the socialism in one country is actually regressive because um, Marxism sees, should see the economy as a global affair, mm -hmm. superseding all national borders or policies. And the reason for that is that we as leftists understand that, yes, there are national borders and, yes, they kind of matter, but we also live within economic conditions, that the global system and how the global economic system interacts with it, it interacts with, a, with itself is really what sets the table, right? right. Like we know that our public leaders only have so much real power. The real power is at ExxonMobil. Yeah. It, it, JP Morgan Chase, like that's where the real power is, right? Yeah. And to those people, they are accountable to no country. Yeah. They're accountable to no one country. And this is where Trotsky was absolutely right, like in the sense and 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 in his interpretation of Marxism. That like, and so, you know, specific features of national economies are measured within the sort of higher reality, as Trotsky calls it, of the world economy. Right. Upon which internationalism of communist parties should be based. So like that understanding that we live in this global system and that if you try to institute socialism in one country, the whole fucking capitalist world will come after you. Yeah, that's right. Which is exactly what happened. So, you know, the <laughs> yeah. Russian Civil War from 1918 to 1922 was essentially the entire globe, including the United States, essentially helping the white army or this sort of the bourgeois democratic or nationalist leaders of Russia gain Russia back from the Bolsheviks and they lost. Um, and, and, um, and part of that was Trotsky was kind of a brilliant military theorist in a lot of ways. He was one of the, you know, he was the leader of the red army and, and, and was quite an astute military tactician on top of being a political one. So, you know, against all odds, they sort of won. But then it's like this like cheap New York Times headlines where it's like, they won, but at what cost? <laughs> and, and so that's the question, right? Where it's yeah. at what cost? Well, at what cost was that you had a you had a country that was completely deeply, deeply demoralized in the sense that, you know, people who had been out with food, their their situation has been deeply precarious for years, mm -hmm. that this sort of socialist program that they had wanted to institute didn't necessarily happen right away. And so they instituted what was called the NEP or the new economic program, which was essentially allowing certain levels of capitalist development within the country. And then the NEP would then develop into the sort of national socialism or the socialism in one country of Stalin. Mm -hmm. And um and I think that Trotsky calls Stalinism like a messianic nationalism mixed with bureaucratically abstract internationalism. So, which I think is absolutely true. I think that like Stalin really leaned into the whole like 
the national struggle and like like in Russia World War II is called the Great Patriotic War and right. like it's leaning into like the nation and the country right which is part of the reason why like even today in Russia even though they're not communist anymore like still like have high praise of Stalin there's like new there's like new Stal- statues of Stalin going up yeah. and like it's because it's they see him as sort of a national liberatory figure Right. Regardless of whether or not he was communist or not. Right. Yeah. And, um, and so like, what's interesting is that because of that, the way that that's set up, um, essentially what Stalin argued in socialism one country is that he, he, he leaned on what he called the law of uneven development, that he's like, look, we're not as developed as the United States is, and we're not as developed as these other countries are. There's no way we could try to do what they're going to do. So we're going to just try to do what we want to do. Hmm. And the problem with that is that like it just completely negates the fact that like a global economy exists in which multiple nations play a role at varying degrees of development. And so um so national differences are just a but of a component of the law of uneven development. They're just sort of built in. Um and that's why Trotsky argues that only socialist revolution in multiple independent nations will allow for the socialist projects to see because if it is an uneven development, then there will be other nations that are more developed than Russia that will also go socialist and they'll be in a stronger position right. to not only support Russia, but to then develop their own socialist program in connection with other socialist states um, precisely because the nations are different. And, um, and that's what I think is, is quite interesting. You know, Trotsky kind of argues that power is super structural. If power one country went from the bourgeoisie to the proletariat via revolution, the dynamics of the world economy would not change. That is true. Right. Yeah. Um, economic power relations between nations are set by stages of development, not degree of economic self-sufficiency. Yeah. So socialism one country is all predicated on, well, if we become self, so self-sufficient enough, well, then we'll have enough economic power to sort of buttress ourselves against the capitalist states. Part of that's true in the sense that the Soviet Union did develop rather quickly. Oh, yeah. And did become the second largest industrial power in the world after World War yeah, II. No Part of that was that. because Europe was bombed to hell. But, <laughs> I mean, so was Russia. I mean, 27 yeah. million Soviets died in World War II. Um, and they lost, you know, they lost so much stuff. I mean, in fact, they had to have horses pull their tanks back home. I mean, it was right. really bad. And so within 10 years, you know, within 12 years of the war ending – they put the first satellite in space. So like some of the sort of socialism in one country or that sort of sort of batten down the hatches development works. Right. But it can only be sustainable for so long because you create such a closed system. Yeah. And the global, e- and the global economy is not a closed system. It's a deeply open one with extremely porous interactions between nations, between firms, between yeah. individual actors within the economy. And so – because of those contradictions, it was it was inevitable that the that the Soviet Union would collapse yeah. in a lot of ways, um, and so, um, so one of the ways that you sort of do this is like the contradiction of the USSR led to food shortages and uneven growth of standard of living for its citizens, mm-hmm. and that was in the 1920s and 30s. While nationalization and planning was crucial to the success of the Soviet economy, its isolation from the global market also crucial to the development of economy, showed the particular weakness. Only international socialist planning alleviates these issues. And so the problem with the difference between Stalin and Trotsky is in, in a lot of ways is this. Trotsky saw the October Revolution and the Bolshevik Revolution as the beginning of the socialist transformation of the world. Mm. Whereas the Stalinists saw it as its apotheosis. apotheosis. At the mm. peak, this is the uh, best thing. That, this is the last thing that has to happen. And but but essentially, socialism in one country could only be successful through protectionism, which is what the Soviet Union right, did. Right. Many countries did. Yeah. Um, and then eventually, the socialism in one country tried to push collectivization of agriculture with pre-capitalist inventory, which led to disaster and further alienation of peasantry from the proletariat. This is where you get the revolt of the kulaks, and then also you eventually have the famines. Mm-hmm. Um, an optimum tempo, in, in Trotsky's words, of development within a country that is according to material conditions sets up international socialism while proving material lives of its citizens. So it's all a balance. Yeah. 
And, you know, it's all, you know, it's, it's as Marxists would call it, it's all dialectical, right? Right, right. And, but it's all a balance that you balance out the different needs of your country and then you balance out the different needs of your country in relation to other nations and into the global economy. Mm-hmm. Um, and so like, that's the, those are some of the ways in which it's just really, really, it's just much different. Like what Trotsky's arguing for is he's trying to play a long game. He's like, look, if we want to do this the right way, if we want to do this in the way that it will succeed and have teeth and endure, we have to do these things in order yeah. for it to work. And because of the conditions of the Soviet Union in 1922, after the Russian Civil War, the conditions to do what Trotsky wanted were not there, or at least they were not there in a way that could have been really workable. Right. And so the Soviet leadership sort of had to reconfigure exactly what they wanted to do. And that's where socialism in one country came in. That's where, in Trotsky's opinion, they sort of they sort of bastardized texts of Marx and, and Lenin to sort of justify whatever they believe. Um, and which is fine. I mean, I find a lot of political writing like this is sort of confirmation bias. They sort of work their, they sort of, they start with a conclusion and then work their way backward. Yeah. Um, but you know, it's, it's kind of here and there. So, um, I mean, we're, we've been talking for how many minutes now? 35. And I, I think I'm only like through like five pages of these notes. We're not going to get through all of it. Um, and maybe we publish the notes as part of sure. the video so people sure. can read them. You know, if they get something out of them, I don't mind that. Um, Sounds like a great idea. But, um, but essentially, like, it comes down to the idea of, of, a, of a permanent revolution is where a vanguard party, a vanguard political party, unites elements within the sort of the country, particularly the peasantry and particularly like some, some elements of the petty bourgeois, like small business owners and shit. Um, and that when they are able to kind of come together, that then they will be able to sort of move forward towards a revolution, which okay. will then institute the dictatorship of the proletariat, which will then institute the democratic reforms, so on and so forth. Um, and what, Trotsky argues through the the entire book of the permanent revolution is that he's basically he's refuting charges that what he's arguing for is against what Lenin wanted. And so he just goes through argument through argument of what Karl Radek's arguing because he's using Radek as the example of basically like these are what the Stalinists are saying about me and here's where they're wrong and sort of lays uh. out like actually a lot of the elements of the permanent revolution that I outlined in 1904 um, 1904, 1905, 1906, um, not only did Lenin agree with them, but they became core components of the October revolution, mm -hmm. which is true. I mean, I think at least in the Trotsky's conception, I think that is true. Like in terms of elements of like using the peasantry as a core component, but not making them be the leader of the revolution. And because Trotsky essentially makes the argument that the peasantry are not capable of being an independent political force. And the okay. reason for that is because they are, and this is where it kind of gets into being, I guess, a little like paternalistic, but essentially they argue that the peasantry, when left to their own devices, will not, they're, they're kind of flaky. And so they okay. might go back to the bourgeois. And, and so they'll kind of go wherever the wind takes them. So what we have to do is get, is convince them that we're, we're really on their side. Okay. Because because here's the thing, if, if, if the Soviet government, if a socialist government comes in and gives the peasants the land back and just does that right away, mm -hmm. but then they try to institute other reforms like collectivization, there's a very good shot that the peasantry will be like, what the hell? You just gave me this land for me to own. Why are you taking it back? Or why are you making me share it with other people? Right. Um, and, and so, which is one of the problems that happened in the 1930s and, um, and why people revolted. Um, and so, yeah, so it's basically like, he basically goes through and essentially talks about how like, no, Lenin actually agreed with me. Okay. And, but it's very unclear how much of, how much Lenin read of Trotsky's idea of permanent revolution, but, <laughs> but, but Lenin's like development of what he would describe as the democratic dictatorship as a model for, for a revolutionary organization parallels many of Trotsky's ideas. 
try, uh, Lenin at one point during a no- November 1917 speech says that there has been no better Bolshevik in reference to Trotsky. Okay. So, so cause here's the thing about Lenin in general, like you're going to find quotes where he like talks, he says nice things about Trotsky and then you're going to find quotes where he kind of talks shit about him. It's the same <laughs> thing about Stalin. Like you'll, right. you'll have some quotes where he says some nice things about him. But there's also quotes where he sort of talks shit about him too. And I think part of it is um, that, you know, from in general, I think the big, big takeaway is that from Lenin's statements and actions from 1905 to 1907, which is when Trotsky's like developing the permanent revolution idea, it is clear that he supported Trotsky and saw him as a comrade, especially in regards to the peasant question, mm-hmm. which I just described earlier. Any issues that Lenin had with Trotsky had been public knowledge and generally fell along lines of criticism of Menshevism, Menshevism, of which Trotsky was sympathetic at the time. So obviously okay. you have the two camps, the Bolsheviks, the Mensheviks, and the Mensheviks argued for a more conciliatory revolution. Essentially, they argued for having the bourgeois democratic revolution first, right. which was the provisional government that, inst- that was instituted after the February revolution um, of 1917. That was the Kerensky government. We talked about that in our uh, Russian revolution episode. Yep. Um, and, but that, but that government sort of fell apart real quick. Um, and part of that was just because um, it didn't have it, like it did, it did not have the support of the peasantry. Yeah, that, but the Bolsheviks did, because it all hinged on who were the peasantry going to support. <laughs> yeah. And 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 it was because the proletariat were the best organized. Um, the Bolsheviks were the best organized. Um, so there is one thing I wanted to say. Uh, where I kind of criticize Trotsky a little bit. I say like, and in, in Trotsky defends his contention that the socialist revolution could be accomplished in an economically backward society. And that to say it could only happen in more advanced countries is economic determinism taken to a quote unquote absurd degree and completely at odds with Marxism. Well, I rate sort of in replying to this, but is that really the case? The Bolshevik revolution did happen, but the counter-revolution of Stalin and the USR's collapse in 1991 might demonstrate some flaw in the idea of the permanent revolution. Trotskyists might retort that these eventualities were a direct consequence of the Soviet Union abandoning the permanent revolution and going with Stalin's conception of socialism in one country. Mm-hmm. This might be the case, but it's difficult to assess a counterfactual. Yeah, yeah that's And that's true. part of the thing that Trotsky does a lot, where he's like, well, if you had just done this... It would have gone like this. Right. But you don't know. But you don't know that. I mean, that's that's like that's the main thing. It's like you kind of don't know that. Yeah. Um, and I think that was Trotsky right that like a country like Russia that was economic economically backward in relation to other parts of the world, um, in terms of capitalist development, could it have a revolution of its own? Yes. That is right. And and I think he was correct because obviously the Bolshevik revolution happened. Right. Um, right. And so, um, and it happened the way that they kind of said it would, which it was a coalition of the proletariat, the peasantry who took over strategic areas of the country. And then, you know, and that was the ball game. But, um, uh, let's see what else. Um, Trotsky envisioned the permanent revolution as a process whereby the proletariat and pre- peasantry, or as he's constantly referring to his town and country, okay. work together to ensure the political domination of the bourgeoisie by the proletariat. And when the dem- democratic dictatorship is constructed, or the sort of the socialist government, democratic and socialist revolutions will appear, appear together. So it's basically saying that we can skip over the democratic revolution part, we can go straight to the socialist part, and that ensures all the democratic revolution stuff. Ah. which in the early days of the Soviet Union, that was true in the sense that, you know, they legalized abortion, they decriminalized homosexuality. They did all kinds of things that expanded people's rights early on. Mm -hmm. And then the Russian civil war happened and they sort of had to batten down the hatches and some of that shit went away. Um, And in fact, during the Stalinist period, uh, the 1930s, not only was abortion banned in the 1936 Soviet constitution, it would not be legalized again until the Khrushchev era of the 1950s. Right. Um, But homosexuality was also criminalized during Stalin's period again, which would not be decriminalized until after the Soviet thaw in the fifties. So a lot of the the supposed democratic gains that should have been permanent and in place by the so-called socialist revolution actually were quite tangential. They weren't, Mm -hmm. they, they, they went away rather quickly. You're allowed and to have rights, but not now and not maybe now. later. <laughs> but maybe later and maybe we can talk about it. Um, <laughs> yeah. um, 
but, but basically, so Lenin believed that the peasants would sort of lead the revolution, but that also the proletariat could be brought to power to carry out the peasants' revolution. Okay. A synthesis of the two groups is exactly what happened in the October Revolution. Um, so, yeah, I mean, so Lenin dedicated his life to the cause of an independent proletarian party, contra the Stalinists who decided to try the peasants to try the peasantry as the leading revolutionary force in China and India, which did not work. Um, Trotsky did not live to see the 1949 Chinese revolution, but it confirmed his position as that revolution largely followed the same track as the Ottawa revolution did, a proletariat leading the peasantry. Mm -hmm. um, and the difference between the Chinese revolution and the Russian one was the revolution happened and then a civil war happened. And in China, it was the other way around. It was a, right. a decades-long civil war that then culminated in the socialist revolution when after World War II, the very tenuous and frosty alliance between uh, the Kuomintang of the nationalists led by Chiang Kai-shek and the communists led by Mao and others, um, that broke down. They were always frenemies. They were always going to be frenemies. And, and, uh, and so that broke down and, and the peasants sided with the communists and the communists led the revolution. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm saying a lot, so I'll shut up there and, you know, you can just maybe respond to some of the shit I've said. Uh, it's into the history stuff that I, I, it's not, I don't know that enough to like yeah. have a commentary of it, on it. It's some of it's, it's, it's interesting. Like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I hope people, I hope that the people who wanted this are getting what they wanted. <laughs> this is what happens when you read. This is what, happen <laughs> it's what happens. I mean, Marxism, Marxism. History is always the foundation of Marxism. Period. Right. Yeah. So, but anyway, go ahead. Well, it's just, uh, I'm, yeah, it's just a lot of, a lot of dates and times. So <laughs> trying to sort it out of my head is kind of where yeah. I'm at. But the short answer is, is that I think that history has proven, in my opinion, I think that history has largely proven Trotsky correct in the sense that if you only have one country go socialist, they have to, then they then have to sort of become a garrison state mm -hmm. um, against the entire capitalist world. Right. And if you look at the only like like the countries that have had more who who still have Marxist Leninist states, and there's really only four. There's there's um, China, Vietnam, Laos, and Cuba. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, North Korea is kind of its own baby, but um, but it's really four. And of the four, the one that has been I guess the more traditional has always been Cuba. That's part of the reason why its economic barriers are much higher because it's, it's kind of, um, it's had less sort of, you know, compromises in terms of its vision. Right. Um, whereas with China and Laos and Vietnam, they've they adopted all, a lot more. Yeah. yeah. They have all economically liberalized. They have free trade zones. They have billionaires. Like they don't yeah. like, you know, there's deep inequalities. There's, you know, there's economic exploitation. There's all of the things that would ha that happen in a capitalist society. Yeah. But the difference is, is that here in the United States or in sort of the larger, the, what would be called the developed world or whatever, is that um, we have, you know, we have multi-party democracies. We have, you know, we have nominal protections for freedom of speech and things like that. Now, obviously, there's a huge difference in theory and practice, okay? Right. I'm not saying that like, America, woohoo, fuck yeah, better than China. No, that's not really what I'm saying. I'm saying that the United States has a constitution. Now that's going to get some backlash if you do that. <laughs> right. No, like like the United States is a constitutional republic. It is a bourgeois republic. It is yeah. a government of, by, and for capitalists, yeah. right? And so, which is part of the reason why like I wouldn't want regime change in China in the sense that like I wouldn't want like the United States to try to institute no, regime change. No, that's right. That'd like, be, I that'd think be terrible. That'd that would be, be horrible. <laughs> it would be absolutely horrible because – Despite my criticisms of the CCP, it's much better for them to be in power than to be like some puppet government run by the West. Um, and, in, yeah. and like, uh, I mean, if you just like even think about what, how that would play out, like the number of people that would suffer and die yep. because, you know, under a capitalist dictator installed by the US, it would just be terrible. It would just be the worst thing that could happen to China. Yeah. Um, so, okay. So when we're talking about like the sort of, was the democratic dictatorship realized in Russia? When we say democratic, did, the, did democratic governments governance happen? Well, 
Um, a bourgeois democratic revolution of the workers and peasants only happened after the October Revolution in that revolution's first stage and not before. To say that it happened before, under Kerensky and after the fall of the Tsar, rejects historical, historical reality and Lenin's analysis of it. Um, but instead of instituting a democratic de- government, government, the October Revolution instituted a proletarian government which then carried out the tasks normally ascribed to democratic dictatorship, as we discussed earlier. This sequence of events proves Trotsky's theory of the permanent revolution to be accurate. But again, the problem with this is it's, you're working, you have a conclusion and you work backwards. So it's Mm -hmm. like, so like, if you believe that the permanent revolution is an accurate state of affairs, you will then review history and the theory to sort of confirm that that's true. Yeah, yeah. And it's an imperfect science. Like this is why political science is a very in political theory is a very imprecise thing. It's not like physics or something. Yeah. And um and so but I do think what's really important to say is that there's this sort of orthodox marxist notion that in order for revolutions to happen there has to be these very specific stages that have to happen in order for it to happen. Mm-hmm. And Trotsky makes the sort of I think the radical departure from that and says actually no that's not true. And in fact, there have been many times in human history where we leap over stages all the time and things happen. Interesting. So he says, I'm quoting him now, he says, uh, quote, it is nonsense to say that stages cannot be skipped in general. The living historical process always makes leaps over isolated stages, which derive from theoretical breakdown into its component parts of the process of development in its entirety. That is taken into its full scope. Now that's a little wordy. I had to read that two or three times to get yeah. a sense of what he meant there. What does he mean? So what he means there is he's talking about um, the historical process always being sleep over isolated stages, which is basically we conceptually come up with the stages and then we right. sort of say these stages happen. And he says, well, history often skips over the stages that we've sort of conceived in our heads. Ah, okay. Um. And the same, and so I'm going back to the text now. The same is demanded of revolutionary policy at critical moments. It may be said that the first distinction between a revolutionist and a vulgar evolutionist lies in the capacity to recognize and exploit such moments. I think this is some good stuff. I think it's, I think what I think is important here is that society does leap. Like yeah. sometimes social progress doesn't happen gradually. Right. We often think that it is. And the liberal conception of history tends to see it that way. That like we sort of gradually build on things before. But that's not the case, right? Sometimes social systems have their own Cambrian events where things just leap, yeah. shoot, 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 shoot. You know, for example, marriage equality in the United States for decades, it wasn't even considered a thing that would even possibly happen. Right. Then it happens in a few states. And then in one day, with one Supreme Court decision, boom, it's legal. Yeah. And that's it. And it's done. And then it's and then we leap forward and then like that's codified again with the um the Marriage Equality Act that passed last year mm-hmm. in the Democratic Congress, where they codified federal protections for same sex marriages and interracial marriages. Because they knew with the um, with the overturning of Roe v. Wade that 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 the other decisions regarding marriage equality could also fall because a lot of the, the a lot of the precedent for Ogburgfell, which was the Supreme Court case that legalized um, marriage equality, yeah. um, was built upon Roe, right? And Loving v. Virginia, which was about interracial marriage was built upon Griswold v. Connecticut, Griswold v. Connecticut, which Roe was also based on. Mm. So it's like they knew, right? And yeah. so sometimes our society just leaps yep. and it just changes overnight. Now that's not often, but it does happen. Yep. And like 1917, like the Bolshevik revolution is one of those moments, you know, 1917 in general is one of those moments where a country goes from being autocratic to democratic to socialist within a matter of months. Right. Yeah. I mean, it, it's, it's, wild to think that in 1917 toward the end of world war one that the king of russia or the czar of russia would be deposed a provisional democratic government would be instituted and then that government would then be overthrown by a socialist government right yeah and that happened in a very short amount of time yeah and 
Um, and so, and in, and in the other book, Results and Prospects, he talks, Trotsky talks about like, well, if we just sort of wait and sort of think of it as being gradual, then maybe we'll get this stuff. He literally says the phrase in the 21st or 22nd century. <laughs> and it's like, oh my God. <laughs> so <laughs> um, yeah. he's right though. Yep. Yep. And so, um, so yeah, I think like that's one, I think one of the good takeaways is that like sometimes progress happens sometimes it happens gradually but then sometimes it just happens in huge leaps and bounds yeah. and society is improved overnight by certain things that happen and and so i think for us as socialists and as leftists i think it's important for us to acknowledge that that we should take advantage of those moments because they will happen yeah and and that's what he says it's like and able to exploit such moments right it's like never you know it's like that quote right it's like never let a good crisis go to waste it seems like it makes me think of like uh, the 2020 uh, uprisings yeah. in the U.S. and and the protests in in Canada too, and how a lot of uh, many people at the moment were like, okay, so let's how do we grab onto this? How do we keep this momentum going? How do we actually turn this into something? Right, and, and then it kind of didn't. Yeah, <laughs> because it just, it didn't really sometimes it doesn't. Yeah. <laughs> sometimes it doesn't, but sometimes it can. Is kind of the point, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, there's one other thing I wanted to mention. Um, there are a couple of things he says in a later chapter that I really liked. He's talking about sort of global politics. And one of them that he says is he says, uh, and I'm paraphrasing. Some of these are paraphrases. I'll tell you when it's an exact quote. But it's like, okay. as capitalist forms of government take different forms, say the U.S. and India, for example, so too will proletarian or socialist forms of governments adapt themselves to the peculiar conditions of a given country or region. The only universal that ties all proletarian revolutions together is that they are led by the proletariat. So this is where Trotsky is getting into the idea that a worker government or a worker society is going to be different in one place than it is in the other, but that right. we're united in our belief that the working class should rule the world. Yeah. And I think that's crucial because I think where he's, he's saying is that there's not a one size fits all. Right. That there's not, you know, and unfortunately I think the Stalinist argued that there is sort of one size fits all and you do it like this and it works and it wasn't necessarily the and case. If it doesn't, and if it doesn't work, then you didn't do it right. <laughs> you didn't do it right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and so the other thing he also says too, and this goes back to something I was saying earlier about in colonial countries, um, they can more easily carry out a democratic revolution based on the national and agrarian question than a developed nation can carry out a socialist revolution. And this is absolutely the case. If you look at the post-World War II decolonial struggle, many nations sought national independence from colonial powers, developed their revolutions upon nationalist and democratic lines which left the question of socialism in the background. South Africa, South Africa is a good example of this. So South Africa and the African National Congress was explicitly socialist. Nelson Mandela was. Right. One of his key allies was Fidel Castro. There was always a socialist component, but in order for the democratic revolution that guaranteed political rights and individual freedoms to the people of South Africa, they had to put the socialist project on the back burner. Hmm. They, they achieved their bourgeois democratic revolution and unfortunately never really quite got back to the socialist one. Yeah. And I think that's very much the case in a lot of the sort of post-colonial countries. Um, um, and so, you know, because of that and because of the contradictions that would arise from uneven socialist development of different nations, it can only be resolved through international revolution and subsequent international so social order. Um, you know, I think it's kind of an all or nothing. I mean, it's like if you have some countries that go socialist, that's great. Maybe they can unite together. But the real goal is to have a global system because yeah. only then can you really get rid of it. Yeah. In terms, and you can get rid of capitalism. Yeah, that's um, uh, that's that's one of the things that you often get into the debate with, uh, like anarchists and Marxist Leninists online, is that uh, often the question comes up with, "Well, what are you going to do when?" Uh, your anarchist state or your anarchist area is being infiltrated by capitalists yeah. and you go, well, we can't <laughs> like, and, and I guess the Marxist Leninist answer is you do Stalinism or you do protectionism in your nation state. Right. Yeah. But for uh, anarchism or a Trotsky, 
Trotskyists, apparently, it's like, well, we actually, what we need is we need to spread these ideas farther so that we, because we can't truly achieve what we want until it's everywhere. Right. And this is, and think about it. Like, so when a revolution, you're absolutely right. When a socialist revolution happens in a society, it happens because essentially the majority or sizable majority of the people agree to it. Right. And it's successful precisely because the people agree to it, right? Yeah. The international system would be the same way. Yeah. So the system would only really work if you had a majority of countries who were into it. Now yeah. would the whole co- the, the exact would the, would the whole world have to go socialist? Maybe not. Maybe not. But at the very <laughs> least, imagine if like let's say for example, I don't know, um the BRICS countries. So Brazil Russia, India, China, South Africa, the BRICS nations, that BRICS economic agreement that was largely spearheaded by Lula when he was president of Brazil. And the BRICS last nations time. are last time, <laughs> not this time, last time. This is like 2009, 2010. This is on my mind because I was just listening to something about it. The BRICS economic order is a very powerful one because its countries constitute half of the population of the earth. Wow. So, uh, you know, because India and China, obviously the two most populous nations on earth, Brazil, which is the most populous nation in the Americas, it's like 600 million people. And, um, and then you have South Africa, which is like one of the most developed nations of Africa. Yep. Um, imagine a situation in which, I don't know, let's say the neo-Trotskyists of, you know, like Russia gained power and they overthrew Putin. And one of the th- first things they instituted was ending the war in Ukraine. So like, let's say they, we pull out of Ukraine and they decide that we want to create a coalition with China. So then those two nations are effectively socialist, although we can get into like the details. Yeah, China, yeah. Okay. Then imagine, then imagine those two countries sort of supporting S- South Africa going, going socialist. And then they all kind of connect together and I think that if you had those five countries as socialist countries, I think the socialist revolution would be unstoppable in the sense that if you have five countries who represent half the population of the earth, one, and two, representing essentially the, some of the biggest countries in the world in terms of economy, yeah. right? China has on any given day, either the number one or the number two con- con- economy on earth. Yeah. Um, and... Uh, Brazil has one of the most dynamic economies of South America. Um, and so if you have those countries united under a common struggle, they're unstoppable. Yeah. And essentially they could, they could tell the United States to go fuck itself because they wouldn't need it anymore. Right. They'd have enough, uh, economic and they would have cultural e- and, economic, and technological political yeah. and military power to just say, we don't need you. Yeah. Which is kind of what the Soviet Union did. I mean, they got big yeah. enough and powerful enough. To basically say we don't need you, and until you do, um, yeah, because right. everybody doesn't need anybody until they do. And that that was kind of part of the downfall, right? Was that yeah, uh, they needed to look outside of their country's borders, pretty much, yeah. Um, and so, I think I think in general that when you look at what Trotsky's advocating for, he's advocating for international socialist revolution and cooperation. Mm -hmm. He wants to build global systems of socialist governance. And and I think that's kind of interesting. I mean, imagine like a United Nations of socialism, right? United socialist nations that, that, you know, and, and, and really like a real united front in the sense of like, because like the Soviet Union was united, but it wasn't, but as we all kind of saw, it, it, it fell apart rather quickly. Um, you know, um, it became a country, it became a socialist country within a couple of years. It pretty much fell out of the one. <laughs> when, it, it, when it fell, it fell fast. Too. It fell pretty fast. I mean, the, the Berlin Wall falls in what, November of 89. Yeah. And two, two years later, the Soviet Union is dissolved. Um, so in, on Chris, uh, in December of 91. So, you know, I think that the, le- the bigger lessons as we kind of start to wrap up, cause I know we've, we're kind of, we've hit the hour mark. I want to be conscious of time. Sure. And also, um, you know, uh, I think that a lot of these general points that we be getting into, I'd be kind of repeating myself. Um, right. and we could talk about like the, the, the sort of the details or whatever. And, and I'm happy to share my notes with folks. 
Um, they do have page numbers for for this particular edition of the book, but like it's all on the Marxist Internet Archive. You can usually kind of figure out what I'm talking about. Um, but long story short, I think that Trotskyism has real staying power in the sense of its of its commitment to internationalism and its commitment yeah. to a mixture of socialist political and economic transformation with ensuring democratic revolution as well, that you institute a certain level of um, democratic rights. Because um, some of the things that he said, like his very specific policies was like instituting of the income tax, instituting of the eight hour day, um, you know, giving the land back to the peasants. Like there's all these very specific things that they're like, when a proletarian government gets into power, it does this stuff today. Right. And I think all those are very good things and things that I, I, I that should be, um, I think, worthwhile. Um, I'm trying to think real quick, like, and if for those who want like a really great overview of everything, Trotsky actually writes a whole chapter that kind of over, that's an overview of everything ah. where he says, what is the permanent revolution and lays out its basic postulates. And there are 14 of them. If you read just this one chapter of this book, you will get the gist of the book. Right. Um, and it's a lot of what we've talked about. So um, would I consider myself a Trotsky? It's no. Um, <laughs> no? Uh, these days, I'm rather ecumenical in my socialism. I pull from a lot of different sources. Um, but, but like I said, I think his commitment to a mix of socialism with democratic institutions and his mix of internationalism are things that we as socialists should aspire to in yeah. thinking about things going forward. Makes sense. Yeah, uh, I... Yeah, I just I can't I can't really I can't think find too much fault with the uh, internationalist kind of idea. That's how I kind of have view things like same. So yeah. Yeah. So that's that's it. That's that's the All that's right. the permanent revolution. And for those who are interested, if you like this, if I if I did if I did what you wanted and and you know, and I tried to do my best here. Um and if you like this in the future, we can certainly do another Trotsky book. Um like we could do, if we wanted to, we could do his book, The Revolution Betrayed, where he kind of lays out in detail what he thinks went wrong with the Soviet Union. Ah, um, that so sounds could, interesting. <laughs> so we could do that book. Um, I think that would be a fun one to do. Um, and then there's also another book he wrote called In Defense of Marxism, which is his other sort of key theoretical text where he um, sort of defends Trotskyism as it was developing in the Americas. Okay. In the 1930s. So, um, so yeah, I think maybe we could do the revolution of trade at some point and kind of go into that as well. Nice. Um, his other books are absolute behemoths. There's no way we could do them. Like, right. you know, like his book on Stalin is like 600 pages. His book on the Russian revolution is like, you know, 800 pages or something like that. So, um, you know, just for, you know, to keep, keep my sanity <laughs> as well as, yeah. um, as well as everybody's, um, patience will, will do shorter works for the show. But, but no, I mean, I think that, you know, I think to understand Marxism, you have to read a lot of the key players, and Trotsky is, is one of the key players, yeah, um, and arguably, other than Lenin, the most you know influential theorist of Marxism, of at least revolutionary Marxism in the twentieth century. Right. All right. Well, what are we covering next time? So next week we're going to be covering a book called The New Class War by Michael Lind. Um, this book is going to be a book – every once in a while we're going to do a book uh, – a review on this show or an episode of this show where we go over a book I didn't really like that much. Uh -huh. um, and this is a book I didn't really like very much. Um, I think it's also good for us socialists to every once in a while sort of veer out of our <laughs> comfort zone yep. <laughs> and read stuff that's sort of more in the mainstream. Michael Lind is very much the mainstream. He's one of the founders of the New America Foundation, what's called New America. He's sort of a centrist, um, you know, sort of centrist liberal. And I think he has uh, some good ideas. I think he has some really bad ideas. And I think that we'll get into them next time. And basically, his book was a way for us to have, I think, a fun discussion about the professional managerial class ah, um, that sort of concept and what we think about that as a concept. Yep, um, sure. So that'll be next time. And then uh, the time, I think the episode after I'm not exactly sure when we're doing it, but I moved up the libertarian socialism book in the schedule. Cause I wanted okay. to do that one before I did one of the other ones. Cause I'm excited to get into that too. So, um, so we've got that, that, that one coming down the pike, but yeah, next time we'll do the new class war. Awesome. So I guess the only thing left is where can people find you and your writing? 
Great. So people can find me at justinclark.org. Um, um, as those who know, who listened to last week's episode, my newest, uh, blog, uh, up is about Mike Rinder and his leaving Scientology, um, which, uh, Mike Rinder kindly shared out on his own blog. And so we got some pretty decent views on our Mike yep. Rinder video. And, um, and then I will be later on in the spring, I'll be publishing a blog post called the humanism of Star Trek. Um, where I'll be talking about, uh, obviously Star Trek and, uh, which was a speech that I gave at the Heartland Unitarian Church up in Carmel, um, last week, uh, not last week, the week before. And I'm um, turning that one into a blog post. So that'll be coming up soon. And then, um, so yeah, you can check my stuff out, justinclark.org. That's my website. Um, you can follow me on Instagram at justinclarkph. PH is for public history. And, um, I also highly encourage people to sign up for Corey's Patreon. <laughs> so, yes. you know, he keeps the lights on. He he does all the really hard work so that all I have to do is read these books and, and flap my gums. <laughs> so uh, I really appreciate that. And so, yeah, definitely follow the Patreon and you can check out my writing at my website. Awesome. Well, thank you very much for joining me. Thanks, Corey. All right. That's all, folks. Thanks for watching and or listening. Remember to share this show with your friends and on the social media site that you use the most. Uh, thank you to everyone who supports this show on Patreon. I really appreciate it and it helps me spend more time on this and my other project. If you want to contribute to all of that, then you can do that at patreon.com slash skeptical leftist. Or you can buy me a coffee at buymeacoffee.com slash skeptical lefty. If you can't contribute financially, then a five-star rating and a review on the podcast app of your choice would be great. If you want to find out more from me, then make sure to check out the show notes uh, for links to all of my stuff and check out my website, skepticalleftist.com. Um, there you can check out my other show, From Many People's Strength, uh, which is a podcast about Saskatchewan politics, the videos I do with my uh, friend Damien Marie at Hope, and all my old content from the Brainstorm podcast. Uh, you can also find links to my Discord, Reddit, and Twitch. You can contact me through my website or by emailing mindofaskepticalleftist at gmail.com. My Twitter is at Skeptical Lefty, and my Facebook page is The Mind of a Skeptical Leftist. Thanks so much for listening and or watching. So, and make sure to leave a comment on the video or on my website. Go join a local org or uh, print off some posters and pamphlets and spread some propaganda. 